Hello, everybody, and welcome to the 25th edition of the Fantasia International Film Festival, um, held once again uh, this year online via the Shift 72 platform, with the addition of a few uh, special screenings uh, in person throughout the festival. Um, we're very happy uh, today to have with us uh, the director of Tiong Baro Social Club, uh, screening as part of the Camera Lucida section. Um, please um, join me in welcoming director Tan B. Tiam. Hi. Hi, hi, Ariel. Hello, everybody in Fantasia. It's really good to, to see you, to meet you um, for the first time. Um, um, Chiang Baro Social Club is, is a film that I really, really enjoyed and part of, as part of, the, of, of, of our lineup. I think it, it's really light, it's really fun, um, but at the same time, it, it, it manages to sort of speak to kind of, um, I think, important issues of our, of, of our time that, that I hope we can get into. You know, but with, with regards to sort of housing and you know, sort of this sort of algorithmic kind of life that we increasingly live, and you know, social indexation and things like that. Um, maybe I want to start with, um, uh, you know, sort of a first question for you is I'm I, I'm interested in in the disparity between um, Habi's um, initial living situation with his mother and then. Um, the Tiong Baru Social Club itself as sort of upscale living situation. Um, what is housing like in, in, in Singapore? And, and in a way, like how likely is this scenario that you come up with in the film? Um, I mean, Singapore is a, is, is a very small country. Um, if this is Singapore, if you go, if you drive from one end to the other end, it, only take you, it will only take you about 45 minutes. So, but it is also a country with 5 million people. So, um, you know, it is a country that is always demolishing things to build, you know, new buildings for people. Um, and I feel that uh, when you do that a lot, you know, I, I think people's memories of their childhood, of where they live, where they schooled, um, and where they had their first date um, disappear um, with their physical you know, disappearance of um, these spaces. So Pearl Bank, um, where Abi uh, lived with his uh, mom, is actually a private uh, development um, that was built in the 70s in Singapore. And when it was built, um, it was actually a very forward looking, brutalist designed um, uh, building. Uh, but over time, you know, I think um, it has, uh, you know, gone through different phases of, um, uh, and because it is located in the center of Singapore, right, and for a long time, I think it was a landmark building. You know, whenever you pass by, you know, you'd be looking at this almost UFO looking uh, building. Um, but over time, I think due to wear and tear, right, um, the people who live there, right, from people who are, you know, the upper class of the society have also changed um, to become more people, you know, who are just... Um, um, short-term um, workers, right, who, who have to work uh, near Chinatown uh, in the vicinity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Whereas for um, Chiang Baru, Chiang Baru is actually a public housing development, right, that, um, that started in the 30s, 40s um, by the British. Mm -hmm. um, and when they first built this, um, you know, neighborhood, they have in mind a kind of communal living, right, um, uh, for the masses. Yeah, and it is really a miracle that um, until today, um, it remains, um, um, you know, um, very well conserved um, and that nothing has changed much um, because of, you know, uh, maintenance as well as, um, I think, um, just uh, how people uh, take pride, you know, um, in, in a neighborhood in terms of its food, in terms of its architecture, uh, so on and so forth. So I always see the film as almost a short reverse shot right between these two estate, which is really just a stone throw away from each other. Mm. Um, what are buildings that we preserve? Um, what are buildings that we demolish? Um, what are things that people remember? And what are things that people forget? Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's interesting. It seems also you kind of are switching the dynamic between this sort of idea of Tiong uh, as a public housing and then turning it into something completely, you know, privatized and, and sort of, um, um, you know, ruled by certain sort of technological requirements. Was that part of the shot reverse shot as well? Yes, yes. Um, so I think to, to reimagine that kind of possibility um, 
and also um, at the you know uh, fate of Pearl Bank um, apartment um, going through on block, uh, which is a collective sale mm. um, for for it to be taken over by you know another development, um, private or public. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Do you? Um, I, I I personally see the film as quite um, critical of a sort of culture of performance and a culture of. Um, you know, sort of increasingly sort of image um, doctored, um, algorithm driven sort of lives that we find ourselves in, whether online or, or increasingly sort of in the in the workspace. Do you do you agree with that with that assessment? De definitely. Um, actually, my training is in electrical and computer engineering, hmm. so um, I'm very interested in pattern recognition and in what you know data tells us about um, uh, things that we might not even know. Um, I think, especially with big data today collected by you know like some of the biggest corporations, um, I think uh, I'm both scared um, by what that means uh, in terms of um, privacy as well as in terms of you know um, what is um, the idea of self um, you know uh, whether are there machines that know better than than I do mm -hmm. about myself um, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I um, think that kind of collection can come from private organization. It can also come from, I think, um, governments. Yeah. Um, um, especially, I think, during the pandemic, um, you see how it could be used, you know, for good. Yeah. But at the same time, I think um, it could also be used, you know, to 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 control people, right? Um, and I think that can go um, very wrong as well in some society. Yeah. 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 And, and, and I mean, part of that, too, that is quite striking to me about the film is that the the world that you depict, which, uh, you know, is apparent to me, you sort of take some liberties with the texture of things. And, 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 and of course, it's kind of this fantasy world. But there's something about um, the, the world, even outside Tiongbaru, that appears to me to be quite um, sanitized, perhaps. Um, you know, there's... Um, you know, there's a striking sign where it's like, um, you know, they're talking about the on block sale and there's a sign that says no, pro, you know, no protests, no protesting. Um, can you talk a bit about that? Like, to, uh, with you know, if people are, are not familiar with Singapore, does that does that point to something, uh, a truth in, in society or was that part of just a fantasy world? Well, I think in Singapore, you'll find a lot of like such um, prohibitions. Yeah, no littering, no spitting, you know, um, no um, jaywalking. <laughs> you know, um, so it is almost like a society where if it is not clearly stated that you're allowed to do something, you cannot do that. Yeah. And I think it is not just um, peculiar to Singapore. I think in a lot of um, other societies, especially in Asia, I mean, mm. when I travel to Thailand, Malaysia and other parts of um, Asia, I think it's very common as well. You know how um, uh, it is a city that I think um, prioritizes order, cleanliness. You know, um, uh, cubing. You know, with um, messiness. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, also, I mean, aesthetically, I think um, the film is sort of pitched between a sort of um, kind of Wes Anderson-like kind of. Um, uh, uh, sort of um, cuteness or, or, or storybook and something a bit like um, um, maybe a, a bit of language from advertising too that I was able to sort of detect and, and which I think makes for a really interesting aesthetic and I, I'd love to hear you talk maybe a bit about how you develop the film's aesthetic which um, which also um, I mean I, the light behind you just reminds me of like James Terrell or something like that um, I would love to yeah just love to hear you talk about um, the, the aesthetic sort of design of the film and how you came to it so I think when we designed the um, visuals um, one of the one of the quote which I um, am thinking about is um, I read this book called the air conditioned nation by Sharon George um, uh, who is one of our you know um, public intellectuals. And he was uh, talking about how on the last day of his office by our first prime minister, Lee Kuan Yew, um, whereas other, you know, like um, lead, great leaders might be thinking about, you know, um, a, a grand kind of celebration, you know, to celebrate their legacy and stuff like that. But for Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, what he did was um, he went about to plant a tree. Mm. Um, so, 
it is something that he started you know, 20, 30 years ago to make Singapore a garden city. Um, so there would always be you know, like um, tree planting. And after he planted the tree, he was walking around with his entourage. And then he put his hand near the, the ground. And then he turned to his people and say, there's not enough shade. The people will feel hot. So it is almost a metaphor, right, of Singapore being like a bonsai. Mm. You know, uh, it has to be, you know, shaped um, so that it will shelter, right, the people. Uh, and over time, you know, um, because of such shelter, the people becomes comfortable. Um, so with that in mind, I was thinking of like a universe where everything is very ordered um, and there is almost like eerie um, uh, sense of symmetry and geometry, right? Um, as if everything could not be left to, to chance mm -hmm. and any kind of, you know, um, things which is not supposed to be there will be sneaked, right? Um, just like a bonsai. Mm -hmm. And um, with that kind of imagery, you know, we wanted to give it a candy pop kind of uh, coating, almost as if, you know, for you to have to accept any like um, uh, bitter medicine or like, you know, policy which might mean hardship to you, you know, then it, it, needs, it needs to be coated, right? Um, so that I think people will find it palatable mm -hmm. right, um, to bite on it. So I think that was you know, um, what we were imagining about um, for the visual. Um, and you can see how it was a mix of both the old and the new, um, because we were also thinking about um, a visual that can pay homage to, you know, um, the past, you know, imagining the future, almost like the kind of brutalist design that you see in Pearl Bank or in Tiong Bahru, you know, that was built in the 30s, um, that was modeled after like uh, sheep and planes, you know, kind of designs. Um, forward-looking, um, you know, um, artists, architects, designers, right, um, who was trying to build something for the future. Mm -hmm. And was it ever a challenge to um, sort of dress it up or, or kind of like, because um, I find the, the art direction of the film is quite, is quite um, impressive, you know, and, and I, can, I can imagine it must have been a little bit challenging. Um, um, how, yeah, um, how was it? Well, I think we had a lot of fun with our direction. Yeah, so, um, you know, when we were going through the pre-production, you know, I think our art team, I was just encouraging them to go all out, right, um, to imagine that world uh, and not hold back. Yeah, so even like the background that you see, yeah, so we were designing logos, we were designing like, you know, um, props, um, and uh, when we were looking at locations, you know, one of our prime location, you know, pulled out very last minute. But then we found this 70s looking bungalow um, that was almost bare with like a, a, a TV peat that we turned into a cuddle peat. Um, so we were just reimagining spaces and having mm -hmm. fun. Yeah. And it, it is really a team effort as well. Uh, it is not just the art team, you know, um, doing so. It is the art team, the camera team, you know, the costume team coming together you know, to design an aesthetic which is, uh, you know, coherent throughout. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and um, yeah, that sense of making the sort of old um, feel futuristic or feel different. Um, did you have to build a lot um, of sets or, or did you get away with transforming a lot of that old? Um... Um, we have to build some sets. Um, and then for the rest, it is really finding the right location. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, uh, trying to find the, the correct angle, right, to give, yeah. I think, yeah, everything yeah, yeah. Uh, a sense of unity. So even like some of the spaces where we have to um, green screen and we have to, you know, join, um, uh, it is also true, I think, uh, computer graphics um, that we managed to do so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Um, I want to talk a bit as well about your, um, your lead actor, Thomas Pang. Um, I think his performance is really interesting. He he plays Habi with a sort of kind of um, this kind of wistful sort of naivete or almost a sort of like dumbfoundedness about the environment, about the world that I think makes him both um, from a storytelling perspective, like a really good uh, vessel, you know, for the audience to sort of observe what is going on and also kind of makes him kind of a perfect kind of victim for the, <laughs> for the more, um, maybe like the more um, sinister sort of um, aspects of, of, of Tiong Bahru. Um, 
I'd be curious to, to know from you what, what inspired the character, but also um, what inspired this sort of approach to the performance. Hmm. So Thomas is a great actor. Yeah, he started in theatre um, and he has been winning like Best Actor, you know, awards, you know, I think twice, if I'm not wrong. Hmm. Um, but this is his first film. Yeah, and whenever I watch him, you know, in theatre, I always thought that, you know, he is so good. In fact, you know, he... he, he he can play different characters in, in theatre and he never miss, you know, even a line. And that was how precise he is. So when I chatted with him about this project, um, I asked him whether he's up for a role which, where he cannot rely on his speech, mm. yeah, um, but his body and his movements. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. So then we started to look at, um, you know, some of the things, you know, um, as references, such as the silent films, the mm -hmm. silent comedies of Buster Keaton. And I pointed out to him that, you know, in a lot of um, these silent films, um, these characters are very Singaporean. Mm. Um, because for a long time, you know, like a lot of, I think a lot of people always have the, have the impression that Singaporeans are very gullible. You know, um, we live in a very sheltered environment, you know, like uh, especially when we travel or when we go out to, make, or to, to do business, we are always being cheated. Um, but I feel that, you know, it is not that, Singaporeans are gullible of what or are not are not streetwise, but I think we choose to believe. I think in the goodness of people, and I think um, we want that to show right uh, that there's a certain child child likeness you know to this character, but there's also a certain you know belief in mankind um, that that he that, that that is not shaken you know by how cynical his role is, and that was the character that we were trying to build. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's funny you mentioned Keaton. I was thinking of uh, uh, Jacques Tati as well while watching the movie. Yes. Um, something like uh, like Traffic, or you know, to you know, to a less yes. maze, yet less maze like, but very much so. This um, sort of yes, uh, definitely, definitely Tati, right? Mm -hmm. and definitely uh, Keaton. So mm -hmm. We were watching those films, and we were you know like um, drawing parallels to them. Um, that a lot of such comedy, you know, masters. They are very Singaporean to us. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's interesting. That's really interesting. Yeah. Um, this is your um, this is your first um, solo um, directorial uh, effort uh, film. I know you co-directed a feature before this, um, but you you've been a really influential part, uh, from what I can understand, in in, in Singapore film, um, both as a producer and also as the head of the Asian Film Archive for for a while. Um, and please correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong. Um, hmm. um, I'd love to hear a bit about that side of, of, of you and, and maybe um, for those who are maybe unfamiliar um, um, to the state of maybe what, what Singapore cinema is like um, currently um, and where you think maybe your film fits into all that. Yeah. So um, after I graduated from university, I went on a backpacking trip. And on the backpacking trip to India, actually, um, I met uh, Tai Ming Liang and a lot of other filmmakers in a film festival. <laughs> and that was when, you know, through my conversations with them, I realized that a lot of their films are not really archived properly. Mm -hmm. And that especially in Asia, that there is a lack of uh, a film archive to preserve these works. Um, and we're not talking about works that are like, you know, um, 50, 60 years ago, but films that are as, as recent as 10, 20 years ago. Um, that has been winning awards, you know, and they were, that they were great films. So when I returned to Singapore, I started to do more research in terms of um, the feasibility of setting up a film archive, right, to keep not just Singapore films, but uh, any films, you know, from Asian filmmakers that needs a home um, so that their works can be preserved for posterity. So um, I founded the Asian Film Archive um, and I ran it for... Uh, four to five years uh, before I left um, to produce as well as to teach. Um, so I, as I've mentioned, I'm an engineer by training. So I've never had formal training in um, filmmaking, except um, watching films, you know, uh, at the Singapore International Film Festival and um, watching films, you know, um, from other sources that I can find. Um, so setting up the archive was sort of like um, my way of, you know, um, watching films that I have missed mm -hmm. in film festivals. And then um, I started to get interested, you know, um, 
uh, in filmmaking because as I was collecting films, I realized that a lot of filmmakers wanted to pass us our films, but they no longer hold the rights to their works um, because they have given up those rights um, as first and second time filmmakers who doesn't really know, you know, what um, those works, um, those contracts that they have signed away, you know, means. Yeah. Um, and so I started to, you know, um, produce for filmmakers um, uh, making their first, second films. Um, um, and I would tell them that, you know, um, uh, I will produce for you, but I want you to hold your rights. Um, and it became a director-driven collective called 13 Little Pictures, you know, where um, it is not run like a studio, um, but it was run really to... Um, to help filmmakers, you know, um, I think, uh, stay true to their vision. Um, so I started to do that. Um, and um, it is really my film school, right? Because as I work with the directors and the filmmakers that I really admire, uh, even though they are young, right? Uh, I think the conversations that we have and seeing how they direct actors, how they, you know, write, uh, I learned how to make a film. So that is how I picked up um, filmmaking. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Um, and then finally, maybe to to wrap it up, um, um, I'm interesting in I'm interested in the story where um, I you know I read that uh, Tiong Baru was a huge uh, box office success um, in Singapore during uh, uh, 2020, despite COVID and everything. Um, how was that experience for you? And and how yeah, just like um, can you talk a bit about about that and the rollout of the film? Yeah, I think um, it was really a gamble. Uh, for us to, to release it um, last year, end of last year, um, because we're not sure, you know, uh, and it was still uncertain, uh, what is the capacities going to be like uh, in the cinemas. Mm -hmm. uh, but thankfully, I think in December, you know, it being a holiday season as well, and then in January, um, uh, we are able to get a good word of mouth. Um, and I think Tiongbaro Social Club being a very different um, Singapore film, uh, I think the audience became curious as well. Uh, I think I'm especially heartened um, to see audiences who have not been watching any Singapore films before, right, come to watch it. Um, so I think with every film that we make, I think it's always about trying to find new audiences um, and to surprise audiences who have been going to the cinema. Uh, and I think that is really, I think, what we hope to do, mm -hmm. uh, to be able to find, I think, audiences who, you know, find that viewing experience fruitful uh, and is able to you know um, share it with their friends. I think uh, that is really a bonus. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Um, do you want to maybe leave us with a few a few parting words or to the audience or or anything? Um... Sure. Yeah, I, I've always been a big fan of Fantasia, right? And I think it's really a dream come true to be able to premiere my film um, at uh, such a great festival. Um, uh, I, it is really a pity that I can't join you guys, you know, um, at the festival. But I'm, I hope that you know uh, I will be uh, in future. I hope you enjoy the film, and do leave us a comment uh, if you um, would like to 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 reach us. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ariel. Bye bye. Bye.